Hello, BookTube. I'm continuing in my uh, weird little read-along of uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. was not planned on my part. I would not. Well, looking ahead to 2023, I would not have thought that I was going to do this. Uh, but uh, David Wiley and Tony from Narrative Adventure were doing the Two Towers, and I was happy to do that as well. I've uh, been forever that I've been reading this book. I don't think I've ever really sat down and started it at the Two Towers instead of at the Fellowship of the Ring. And I very seldom have crawled through this chapter by chapter, line by line. Like a lot of Tolkien fans, I've, I've read this many times, but the rereads tend to be bouncing around to the bits I really like. And this read-along, this chapter by chapter read-through of Lord of the Rings really showed me what I was missing. There was a lot of fine detail that uh, I was just glossing over. Very happy about that. Plus, it was in good company. <laughs> lots and lots of... of uh, Good observations and also good comments from all of you. I got a comment on my last video. I, I was opining on the fact that Gandalf continues to say, the wizard Gandalf, now that Sauron is defeated, he continues to say, the third age was my age, I'm not sticking around, I won't be here long. Uh, and I, I mentioned in that video, doesn't, doesn't Gandalf have friends? <laughs> isn't, isn't he friends with the rest of our main character? Why is he talking about this suddenly like it's only a job? Uh, and one of you, uh, go, a user, a viewer by the name of, going by the name of Spongebob, wrote in and said, well, that was his task set to him by the Valar. And he was the only one who stayed loyal to that task. And that is to defeat Sauron, to be the enemy of Sauron, and to shore up the resistance to Sauron among all the peoples of Middle-earth. And that he was the only one who stayed loyal to that. And I agree with that characterization, but that doesn't answer my question. I mean, the Valar don't, don't as far as we know, the commission of the Astari when they come to Middle-earth, it doesn't say anything about what they do when their mission's over. <laughs> it doesn't say anything about that at all. And it obviously isn't binding. The two blue wizards go to the east and never, as far as we know, have anything to do with Sauron. Or maybe are suborned by him. There's a whole story there that we'll, we'll never know. It's not even hinted at in the Legendarium. You could, if in the time, when the time comes, 50 years from now, when all this is in the public domain, you'll be able to write your own novel about Alatar and Palumbo. You'll be able to write your novel about what the blue wizards did in the east. Uh, but also, Radagast, as far as we know, he is still in Middle-earth when the white ships leave for the Havens. Gandalf might be going on that ship, but Radagast doesn't. And of course, Saruman, it totally ignores the commission of the Valar to help and encourage and strengthen the will of mankind. He sets out a shop of his own to be dictator of Middle-earth. And, I mean, yes, there's that line from, from The Two Towers where Gandalf says, I've been sent back until my task is done. But it's obviously not an automatic recall. It, once his task is done, he doesn't just disappear or die <laughs> or anything like that. He's free to stick around. He chooses not to. All of a sudden, all of these relationships that he's had, all the affection that he's had for the Shire, just seems to evaporate. Uh, suddenly, all he's thinking about is, I can't wait to get back. I can't wait to leave my workplace. That still bugs me. It still bugs me a little, but that is part of the theme of these last chapters that we're getting. Before we finish the book and approach the doorstep of the appendices. <laughs> is Steve going to read the appendices? And if he is, is he going to manage not to have a coronary? Because that will lead him straight into talking about Amazon's The Rings of Power. <laughs> we shall see. <laughs> we'll still see what form that takes. But we're dealing with a, a chapter today called Many Partings, which continues with this very autumnal very end of things theme in all of these final chapters. It is actually a time of amazing beginning. King Elisar and his wife have reunited the, all sorts of genetic lines. They are, they are ruling over a completely uncontested, gigantic kingdom of men that is prosperous and happy. Treaties have been made with the Easterlings. The Lord of the Rings has been overthrown. The lands have been are peaceful and they will be brought back to health. Everyone is treated fairly by King Elisar. All of our friends are, are in Gondor, happily enjoying themselves. You, it's a time of massive beginnings, but it, it's mainly, Tolkien views it mainly as times of endings. The Lord of the Rings is always about endings. The whole book is about how an enchanted earlier world is first threatened and then saved, but is doomed anyway. Uh, the, uh, the quintessential embodiment of that, I think, in the whole of The Lord of the Rings is that we are pretty much sure from the beginning that the three elven rings will fail when the one ring is destroyed, even though it never touched them. And even though they've been working against it for thousands of years, they will fail and their ability 
to sustain supernatural wonder in the world will disappear. Th that is Elrond's uh, idea and in the Fellowship of the Ring, and we're given very little reason to think that that won't happen. And it does happen. Gandalf explicitly tells us the three rings have failed. Their power is broken now that the One Ring is gone. So all sorts of things now have to end. And we get that in many partings. A whole bunch of our characters are saying goodbye to each other. Celeborn and Galadriel are saying goodbye to everyone else. There, We see many, many meetings and then endings. For instance, when all of our characters are on the road, peacefully making a progress through Middle-earth for what is clearly going to be the last time together, they meet Saruman, <laughs> who's on the road. He has no staff. He is, he is uh, sweet-talked his way past the vigilance of the Ents at Isengard. Uh, they, he talked to them, and we've, we've been told over and over again that Saruman's main power is in his voice. On some level, he manages to convince them to let him go that there's no harm left in him anymore. Of course, those of you who've read The Lord of the Rings already will know there is one little piece of harm left in him. He makes his way to the Shire, which he views on some level as the source of all of his humiliation. He makes his way there, but we're not there yet. Uh, in the chapter Many Partings, our heroes meet him on the road. And even now, at this late date, both Gandalf and Galadriel offer him a second chance. Even now, on the road, he's utterly bitter. He doesn't want to talk to them. He, when, when they tell him this is the last time we'll offer, he says, well, good, I won't have to refuse it again. He's totally embittered. He's not thinking about it anymore, as we saw him do for a fraction of a second on the porch of Orthanc. He, for a fraction of a second, wonders. He, I don't think he's, he's ever thinking, should I do good? I think in that moment in, at Orthanc, he's thinking, where am I less likely to come to harm? If I take their offer, well, I can hoodwink them down the line. If I don't, I'm here alone, and if Sauron wins, I'm the first object of his vengeance. Here on the road, all of that, all of those considerations are gone. He just wants these people to leave him alone. He utterly scorns the idea of a second chance. Uh, and they do leave him. But they're also leaving the West. They're, they're leaving their normal, cons normal interaction with the rest of the world. And although we don't get much in the way of explicit talk like that about Gimli's people, the dwarves, we're pretty sure that that's going to happen too. The, the world of the Lord of the Rings, the world of this story, has ended. It is making room for a new world, the world of men, uh, that Tolkien pretty much is pretty much implying is our world. I think that he even implies it about hobbits. Of course, there are no hobbits in the world, <laughs> in our world. I think he even implies it about hobbits, that they, that, I think that's the Entrot. I think that's the whole point with Merry and Pippin getting taller because of the Entrot, is that eventually the hobbits are going to be part of the natural world. They, the, the Shire is not going to be inviolate the way it is now. King Elisar makes a rule that big people cannot enter the Shire without permission, not even himself. Uh, but as our friends are, uh, are wandering. They are they're making this progression through the world. They get near the gates of Moria, and uh, and then they tarry a little. They wait just a little because they're you. Tolkien captures it really well. They're reluctant to part with each other. They're they're there's a great deal of sadness, melancholy, and reluctance for all of these hard truths to be true, for this world to be ending. Uh, there's a great scene too that. I, I, I've read it a million times. I'm still not 100% sure the higher point that Tolkien is trying to make in it. Uh, Here now for seven days they tarried, for the time was at hand for another parting, which they were loath to make. Soon Celeborn and Galadriel and their folk would turn eastward, and so passed by the Redhorn Gate and down the Dimral Stair to the Silverlode and to their own country. They had journeyed thus far by the West Ways, for they had much to speak of with Elrond and with Gandalf, and here they lingered, still in converse with their friends. Often, long after the hobbits were wrapped in sleep, they would sit together under the stars, recalling the ages that were gone, and all their joys and labors in the world, or holding counsel concerning the days to come. If any wanderer had chanced to pass by, little would he have seen or heard, and it would have seemed to him only that he saw gray figures carved in stone, memorials of forgotten things, now lost in unpeopled lands. For they did not move or speak with mouth, looking from mind to mind, and only their shining eyes stirred and kindled, as their thought went to and fro. I've read that passage a million times. I'm not 100% sure what Tolkien is saying there. But he's going to a great deal of effort to, say, to, to make these characters. If we have known, we have known these characters, maybe 
Well, Elrond and Galadriel and Gandalf, maybe not Caliborn quite so much, but we've known Elrond, Galadriel, and Gandalf in moments of extremely excited emotional passion. We've known them to care and be involved. And yet in this moment, Tolkien is going out of his way to portray them as alien, not even alive. That, that Elrond and Galadriel and Caliborn and Gandalf would be sitting under the starlight and that a passerby would think they weren't even real, that they were just statues. The, the, he's, he's, Tolkien's going out of his way to make them look alien, to make them seem alien, which, of course, they always have been, but they haven't seemed it. And I always wonder about that. I always wonder what's going on there. I don't think it's any, it's any uh, mistake or coincidence at all that that kind of a characterization is happening here at the end of everything, when they're leaving. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm still thinking about it. I think that, it, on, that the best guess that I have is that it's Tolkien's gambit to slowly but steadily shift the focus of the, the emphasis of the narrative to the so-called real world, to the world of, of crops and Hobbiton and all that sort of thing, and away from the grand mind-to-mind -mind conversing of these ages-old beings. These ages-old beings are not going to be around anymore. In this chapter, Gandalf tells Treebeard that it's entirely possible the Fourth Age will outlive you. <laughs> Zelda's living thing on Middle-earth. He tells Treebeard, yeah, it might seem like a little bit amount of time to you, but don't count on it. Don't count on your, on outliving the Fourth Age. Uh, that's an amazing thing. It's said as just an ordinary conversation, but it's an amazing little moment. Uh, and it's there. There are a number of them like that in this chapter, where where the grand fantasy things of the Lord of the Rings are being very subtly but very firmly pushed aside. Uh, and that continues. <laughs> that, that, they, that continues in the next chapter. We will move on to there. The next chapter is called Homeward Bound. Uh, and we'll, we'll do that next time as we're slowly but surely approaching the end of The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up for now, and I will see you soon. Thank you, Booktube.